Hello, my name is Tiffany C. Wright and I am the resourceful CEO. Please remember to like this video and subscribe to the resourceful CEO channel. Today, I'm here to talk to you about five ways or five things you can do to increase your likelihood of obtaining funding. Again, this applies to everyone, but for black owned businesses, Hispanic owned businesses, this is often finding sources of financing or, or getting the funding can be difficult. Um, I haven't had difficulty, but I will say that I have off that I've sometimes had to tap into two or three different forms of financing in order to get the total financing needed. So, um, but I want you to think creatively. That's my big thing. Think creatively, just like you would about other issues presenting themselves. Issues are just challenges. They're not deal killers. They're just challenges. And, and sometimes people kind of like, well, I'll just, I'll, I'll just keep trucking along and being very small until I can hit a certain point, but you don't have to do that. I'm all for bootstrapping. I'm not saying that, but if you have to bootstrap and stay teeny tiny for five years, when you could have sought other, um, other means of accessing funding and be, you know, I don't know, 20 times the size that you are uh, in five years. So for instance, instead of being $200,000 in five years, you're now at $4 million in five years. That's what I would want for you if that is your goal. So let's talk about the five ways that you can increase your likelihood of obtaining funding. And I'm primarily talking about bank funding. Some of this will apply to other sources of, of funding, but I'm primarily talking about bank funding. Bank funding is the cheapest form. You know, with equity, you don't have to repay until you actually have the cash flow to repay investors or, you know, you have an exit uh, event or something like that. But, um, but, you know, they expect returns of 20 to 50% or so, depending on the kind of investor and your company and how close you and the investment, you and the investor are, I mean, or you, is that your friend or is that, you know, a third party that was introduced to you? But anyways, let's stick to the subject at hand, five ways to increase your likelihood of obtaining funding. So the first thing to do is to generate monthly financial statements. Close your books every month and generate monthly financial statements. And then you have those to review. So if you can show that you have monthly financial statements, not just the tax returns, not just quick QuickBooks that goes on and on and there's never any like cut off <laughs> because you don't close your books, then that speaks to your, you having a higher level of financial acumen. And if you have a higher level of ac financial acumen, if I'm a banker, I'm going to be more comfortable lending to you because you obviously understand what's going on in your business. So generate those monthly financial statements. And then of course you need to know what they're saying <laughs> to you. <laughs> I'm laughing because I do have clients who d look at the financial statements, but they're not exactly sure what they're saying, except for, you know, a profit and loss statement. They don't really know what the balance sheet is telling them. Um, so the second thing would be for you to have a strong relationship with a business banker. A strong relationship with a business banker is something that I continually advocate for. So I'm not going to go into uh, more detail here, but just suffice it to say a business banker is someone who's typically VP level or above 
at a community bank. Um, typically, if you really want a lot of attention at the big banks, you need to be, you need to have at least 30 to 50 million in revenue. If you do have that, then go for it. But I, I really like community banks, minority owned banks, um, even CDFIs, com um, community development financial institutions. Uh, but having a bank, having a relationship with someone who makes who makes decisions, funding decisions, who understand who understands credit, who understands the risk, and who can advocate for you, that's what you want. So that's why I want you to have that that relationship. Number three is generate a cash flow statement. So many business owners just generate income statement and balance sheet. And I've already said so many don't can't don't really understand what the balance sheet is telling them. Um, I mean, they look at it and you can see that says, you know, loans, <laughs> assets, equity, but they don't really understand the importance of that. And so I will talk about that at a different time. But the cash flow statement is historical. And with it, all of these statements are historical, meaning that they're looking back at what happened in the past. And the uh, so cash flow statement and income statement both are over a period of time. The balance sheet is a snapshot in time, like today. Um, whereas balance sheet and cash flow statement are like you know Q1, Q2, 2020, or something like that over a, a period of time. And but what the cash flow statement does is it it aligns the income statement with the balance sheet. So what what happened on the income statement and how does that flow through and impact the balance sheet? So if you have that and you can actually speak to that, that's really impressive because I don't know what the percentages are, but I'd say they're like, I don't know, low, 2% of the typical small business owner with under 20 million in revenue, really, uh, who does not have an accounting background understands, uh, yeah, I, that's how many people <laughs> understand the cash flow statement and what it does <laughs> and how it works. So if you can generate that and be able to speak to that, very, very impressive. Number four would be, number four is create an executive summary. If you have an executive summary that summarizes the business, where it's at, where it's been, where it's going, who are your competitors, um, what's your strategic plan for growth, what's your core competency, meaning how do you differentiate yourself from your competitors, how much money do you need, what are you going to use it for, and a, a brief description of your financials. If you can put all of that into like a four to six page executive summary, that's really impressive. Then that's something that you can leave behind with the banker. And it just clearly shows that you you are really thinking out about your business and you understand your business. Because that's, again, when you understand your business, that's really important. Um, the risk to me as a banker is, is much lower. So you can talk frankly to me about your business and the risks uh, and you know the ups and downs and so on, then I'm going to feel that much better um, about providing you with a loan. Again, the whole point is to mitigate the risk to the banker and or to the bank and to the banker and increase your chances or your, your likelihood of getting funding. Please remember to like and subscribe to this video and to this channel. Thank you. Okay, number five. <laughs> I was just talking to someone about Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. It's number five, boys and girls. No, just, <laughs> just kidding. So the fifth one is to have an advisory board. It is, you know, a lot of business owners don't really fully know how to delegate. I hear so many say, I don't, you know, I don't have really good people or 
this person have a few good people, but the rest are not that great or whatever. But it typically, you know, I always say that if you're talking about more than one person, again, if you have, you know, 50, 100, 150 employees, it's a different story. But if you have a small team and you have all these issues with employees, it's not them, it's you. <laughs> so, but if you if you are shouldering all the responsibility of the business and you don't have a general manager or a COO or someone like that that can run the business, uh, that can really run the business without you being there, I'm not talking about strate strategically, I'm talking about the basic day-to-day -day operations, then having a strong advisory team is definitely very useful. Actually, an advisory team or an advisory board is helpful in any way, even if you do have a strong executive team, um, because it just shows that you're thinking strategically about the growth of your business and you're reaching out and harnessing the resources that are out there that comes in the form of other individuals who are maybe uh, who are at the top of their game in other areas. For instance, you may be like me, you may be a strong financial and operations person, but marketing may not be your cup of tea, but you don't have, you might have a, you know, some a part-time marketer on your staff, but that is not a strategic marketer. But you could have a strategic marketer sit on your advisory board, or you could have, um, a, you know, if you're new to the construction industry or you're trying to grow in the construction industry, then you could have, in your company has 3 million in revenue, you could have someone on your board, on your advisory board, who has 10 million in revenue, um, whose company generates 10 million in revenue or something like that. So the point is to have two or three different people sit on your advisory board who, and these are people who will be a creative, okay, I say this, um, who will be very helpful to uh, positioning your business as um, being, you know, strong and supported uh, to an actual lender who's making this decision about whether or not to finance you. Just more helpful tips and insights from the Resourceful CEO. I am Tiffany C. Wright, the Resourceful CEO. Please remember to like this video and subscribe to the Resourceful CEO channel. Thank you.